And back here at home, Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu and other African leaders at the Mid-Year AU Summit had declared their commitment to advancing integration, development and cooperation within the continent. The leaders representing the Bureau of the Assembly of the African Union and chairpersons of the eight regional economic communities, as well as regional mechanisms, all concluded with the adoption of a draft declaration. The meeting, chaired by President Azali Usmani of Comoros and the chairperson of the African Union, was attended by President Bola Tinubu of Nigeria, who is a chairperson of ECOWAS, as well as the presidents of Kenya, Egypt, Gabon, Djibouti, Libya, Senegal, and DR Congo. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Samarachi Bani, reports. <laughs> President Bola Tinubu joined other African leaders in attending the Africa Union's fifth mid-year coordination meeting in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. The well-attended opening ceremony held on Sunday at the United Nations African headquarters in Gigiri, Nairobi. It was a first for Nigeria's president, who had been sworn into office nearly two months before his presence acknowledged by the Kenyan president, William Ruto. <laughs> Mr. Ruto, in his opening speech, informed leaders on visa issuance, which he says may not be necessary when next they arrive in the country because Kenya is the home for all. I want to give you my commitment that uh, as the people of Kenya, we are having a national conversation as to whether we should have any visa for anybody coming home. So next time, <clears throat> next time you come to Nairobi, you might not need a visa. He then turned focus on the reason for the meeting, which is part of efforts towards African integration. He described the continent as a busy one, reasoning solutions together and getting results. It is more critical now than ever before that we marshal our collective consciousness, willpower, solidarity and unity to fulfill our fundamental generational mandate of introducing Africa as a new global power, ready and able to provide leadership towards a new industrial age that shall simultaneously usher in an era of inclusive development, shared prosperity, and effective climate action. Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu in his maiden speech as Nigerian President and ECOWAS Chair warned on past plundering and exploitation of the continent, which he says should remain in the past and never repeated. He emphasized the need for Africa to overcome its challenges and work towards a prosperous future, focusing on inclusive growth, good governance, and leveraging the opportunities provided by the African continental free trade area, whose agreement only 13 out of 15 ECOWAS member states have ratified. Speaking on the free movement of persons, President Tinubu informed that ECOWAS had commenced action toward the implementation of the harmonized visa regime that is the ECHO visa to facilitate the free movement of non-ECOWAS citizens. He reaffirmed ECOWAS' focus on building regional infrastructure, including the Lagos-Abidjan Corridor Highway, to promote economic activities and integration. Your Excellency. The Deputy UN Secretary General Amina Mohammed highlighted the important role of the UN as a key contributor to an Thank empowered you. and transformed Africa. Your Excellency. Using herself as an example, she called for a more united continent. The continent faces a moment of reckoning when the world appears to take its gaze off Africa. We may appear down, but we are far from out. And as our leaders, 
we continue to count on you to forge a path towards delivering the vision for Africa that is enshrined in the, 20, in the 2063 agenda. In the course of the meetings, the AU Executive Council is expected to appoint some members of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, the African Advisory Board Against Corruption, the Africa Union Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, the Africa Union Commission on the International Law, and a member of the Board of External Auditors. Amarachi Ubani, Channel Television News. Still to come on the world today. Turkey's President Tayyip Erdogan opens to meeting with his Syrian counterpart in certain conditions. Welcome back. Rising temperatures across Europe and in parts of the United States, plus floods in Asia and in parts of the United States, we have been tracking them for you right here on the world today. And indeed, much of the European region is set to be experiencing extreme heat at the moment, with temperatures set to be heading higher than the 40s. But interestingly, China is experiencing both heat and the floods, a major problem in other parts of Asia. And for India, Pakistan and the latest tragedy in South Korea, much of which we will see later. But here's a wrap of weather and weather events across the world. Tourists in the Italian city of Rome have been trying to cope with the heat wave that hit the country and southern Europe in July. Metrologists have warned that temperatures will hit record highs in the coming days. The country has been experiencing scorching temperatures for several days, damaging agriculture and leaving tourists scurrying for shade. They've also dubbed the next phase of the European heat wave, Charon, a reference to the fairy man of the souls of a dead in Greek mythology. Greece, on the other hand, had to shut the ancient monuments of the Acropolis for five hours on Friday to protect vistas at one of the world's most famous archaeological sites. Huge crowds crammed into long queues in the heat to enter the site, many donning hats and fanning themselves, others drinking water and carrying umbrellas. Many tourists were part of organized tours, including cruise ship tours with set itineraries for the day. Over in Spain, more than 300 firefighters worked to control a wildfire in the Canary Island of La Palma. It has burned more than 4,650 hectares and forced the evacuation of 4,000 people. Huge root flames were seen raging in Punta Gorda, a wooden area in the north of the island where the fire started. Held by the Spanish military emergency unit, the firefighters have struggled to bring the wildfire under control on the island which forms part of the Canaries archipelago off the coast of Western Africa and has suffered extreme temperatures similar to those seen in a heat wave afflicting Southern Europe. Sunday marked the 17th consecutive day of temperatures over 43 degrees Celsius in the U.S. state of Arizona. Residents took to water parks to stay cool. It's like a very dry heat, like, and like, if you ever like stood next to an oven while you're baking something, it's like that, but like, it's coming from every direction and you can't escape it unless you go inside. It's very, very hot. It is miserable being outside unless you're in the water somehow. Uh, and it's actually not safe at all. So I, I work in construction and my guys really suffer through it. And it's, uh, it is really a hard time of year to live in Arizona. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely climate change. I, it's just, I, don't know, I moved down here in, gosh, 2004, really. And, you know, people were talking about a drought back then, and it just really has, we've had years where it's been wet and cooler, but overall it's just been hotter and hotter over time. So The state of Texas also experienced extreme heat on Saturday, sparing residents to seek relief at community pools and water parks around the state. Hundreds of people flocked to the Barton Springs pool in Austin, while in San Antonio, children played in one of the city's 12 public splash pads. Texas and other southwest U.S. states remain under extreme heat advisories due to a stubborn high-pressure dome, with temperatures hitting 43 degrees Celsius or higher over a wide area. Analysts have warned that hot temperatures can cause both heat exhaustion and heat stroke. They also warn of concentration of heat in the southeastern portion of the U.S., 
from Louisiana to Arizona to Southern California and parts of Florida. But the United States is also experiencing floods. At least four people were swept away and killed by a flash flood on Saturday in the upper Makefield Township in Pennsylvania, about 20 miles northeast of Philadelphia. Rescuers said they are searching for another three people, including a nine-month-old boy, his two-year-old sister, and also an adult woman. The state of New York has been battling floods for more than a week now. The governor, Kathy Hochul, said that areas of the state had been upgraded from a flood watch to a flood warning and warned residents in those areas to stay indoors. Speaking of floods, perhaps the worst hit has been India, where residents of New Delhi and Manali have been grappling with damage and loss caused by floods after heavy rain. The Yamuna River's levels are their highest in 45 years, following unusually heavy rainfall in New Delhi and hilly northern states, forcing the evacuation of hundreds of people as the Yamuna, which runs through the city, breached its Delhi has recorded rainfall 91% above normal. This monsoon season that began on June 1st, it has received 309 millimeters of rainfall so far in July, the third highest for the month for at least 12 years. And in China, heavy floods left vehicles and residents stuck in swirling muddy water in part of Ishankoin and in Inner Mongolia, while other parts of the country continue to grapple with heat waves. Flash floods caused by torrential rain have ripped through parts of China over the past few weeks, with Chongqing hit particularly hard in the last few days. Some residents have been rescued from their inundated homes by local firefighters. Analysts have warned that the flooding can hamper food production which could be a major worry across the world this year. And VOA's Lisa Bryant is in Paris, France, where hopefully it's a lot cooler. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Anne. How are you? I'm and it is well. a lot cooler. It's a lot cooler. Oh, great. <laughs> well, but we know that rising temperatures have been recorded across Europe. What is it like? I know it's cool, but in other parts of France, how, what is it like? It's, it is, I mean, I think a lot of French and other Europeans are rather jealous about us in Paris, but yeah, it's a lot uh, warmer elsewhere in the continent. And even in France, we've got, um, uh, we're bracing for uh, some really high temperatures. I think the worst uh, areas are like Rome and Italy, Sicily, uh, Sardinia. Um, right next to these uh, two Italian isle islands is Corsica, but it's going to be still um, quite lower in terms of the heat than some of these others, which could get up to 48 degrees Celsius. As you noted, Greece in your report is also bracing for another hot um, day tomorrow, especially that's supposed to be Tuesday, the hottest day of the week. Um, also Spain that's already been hit by a heat wave. So yes, Europe is, is really uh, going to be getting some very hot weather. And a reminder to your, re your watchers, uh, this is coming after the hottest June in the planet last month and the hottest July ever uh, worldwide as well. So Europe especially, it's the hottest uh, or the fastest warming continent in the world is, is very worried about this. Well, and the rising temperatures have also been accompanied by warnings of wildfires, some of which are already beginning to, uh, we, we're already seeing, like in Spain, a hotspot for these wildfires especially. What is the general warning for other parts of Europe, especially, let's talk about areas experiencing the heat wave at the moment. Right. Well, I mean, a lot of uh, parts of Europe also got a, a wildfire last year. And so people are, are, are very concerned this could come back. Uh, beyond what's happened in Spain and La Palmas, as your report said, there's also right outside Greece that was one area that also had a wildfire. Um, this is an, also an incredibly dry, dry um, time for many parts of Europe. There has not been enough water in France, uh, where last year we had um, a major wildfire in the southwest near Bordeaux. It was huge and uncontrollable controllable for days. People are, are bracing for potentially more to come. And then uh, this is also the case, very, very dry weather in Spain and parts of Italy. So along with the heat, there could be also the potential of fires coming into a very, very dry area.
And talking about um, the lack of water almost, so what is the caution here about water use, knowing that many people are going to want to sprinkle here and there at least? Yeah, uh, of course, exactly that. People are going to say, like in your reports, well, it's hot, uh, let's get into the pool, let's, you know, sprinkle down or whatever. Um, a number of areas are facing water restrictions. France has... Um, Many, many of its departments have different uh, stages of water alert from, you know, not being able to water your lawn to, you know, only using it for like really essential services like potable water or health. Um, so, yes, I think there's a number of restrictions. France is not alone. The question is, are citizens going to be living up to it, not, you know, filling up their pools? you know, not uh, watering their lawn if they don't have to and ensuring, and in some cases, farmers can't use water as well. So yeah, there's there are water restrictions. Part of it is gonna, of course, they're gonna be monitored, but then a lot of it is gonna be dependent on whether citizens are gonna follow it. But, you know, it's a very dry time, water tables are down. And so this is a real concern in Europe. Well, I can imagine. But a lot of times when things like this happen, I mean, there's news and information about how people can actually survive the heat. So what sort of warnings are going on at the moment for people to teach them or sensitize them about things like this and residents of areas where floods have also been prone? Yeah, I, part of Europe had had gotten uh, floods last, last, I think, in May. Um, and people have... Uh, still remember last year, for example, we had soaring temperatures. Um, I think it was one of the hottest, if not the hottest summer on record. Um, and the thing about European, you know, cities and countryside too, is many don't have uh, air conditioning like you would see, for example, in the United States or other parts of the world. And in France, um, you know, there, been, there were something like 60,000 worldwide, 60,000 deaths last year because of the heat. In France, we remember more than two decades ago where many older people especially um, died of the heat during a heat wave around 2002, 2003. So there are especially um, warnings for older people and for members of their families to be careful, um, to stay indoors, like in Greece, you know, stay out of the sun during the hottest times of the day, stay inside, um, you know, dress appropriately, Try to find water places where you can stay cool or, you know, have access to water, or, you know, like pools, etc. So, yes, this is these kinds of warnings are, you know, sort of circulating on the airwaves and the radios um, across the, the continent. And um, people are just hoping they're not going to get the same kinds of fatalities that they got last year. Well, natural um, events like this have been linked to climate change. But if these are the conditions at this summer, what are meteorologists saying about the fall and even the winter, which will be coming again soon? Yeah, um, a lot of climatologists and weather uh, reporters is, are definitely linking this to um, to climate change, um, especially, as I said, Europe is the fastest, the fastest heating up continent uh, on, on the planet right now. Um, and it's, it's unclear what's actually going to be happening in the fall and winter, but, uh, the warm weather is also being linked to El Nino, which is a, a naturally occurring phenomenon. And, um, Many climate people who are looking at the weather, long-term weather patterns say it's likely to continue, which means that warm weather will likely continue. And extreme weather events, whether they're, you know, droughts or floods or, you know, other extremes, may also, it's the, the probability is that it's much more intense because of El Nino and because of a changing climate. All right. Thank you very much. VOA's Lisa Bryant in Paris, France. Thank you so much for your time on The World Today and please stay cool. Thank you very much, Anne. Meanwhile, the South Korean President Yoo Soon Yeol has visited those affected by the landslide triggered by heavy rains that has killed 19 people so far and left eight of them still unaccounted for. That incident in a village in North Gyeongsang province happened on Saturday. President Yoon examined the aftermath of the landslide that had hit on Saturday, assuring victims the government would restore the destroyed area. The president has also been responding to the disaster 
at the flooded tunnel in Cheongju, where 16 vehicles, including a bus, were swamped by flash floods still on Saturday after a river levee collapsed. But earlier today, he ordered an all-out effort to handle the devastation caused by days of torrential rain as the death toll grew to 39, including a dozen of people found dead in a submerged underpass. Forces in South Korea searched for more bodies trapped in a flooded tunnel after five bodies were recovered earlier Sunday morning, taking the death toll from the days of torrential rain pounding the country to 31 as of that time. The victims were found from a bus that had been submerged at a flooded underpass in Chongju on Saturday. The Ministry of Interior and Safety announced more deaths earlier as the heavy rains caused landslides and floods across the country with evacuations covering more than 7,000 people. As the morning wore on, authorities said at least seven bodies of people trapped in the flooded tunnel had been pulled out. Authorities mobilized about 30 divers for the search and rescue. They were grappling with a lot of mud in the tunnel. Rescue teams were kept busy over the weekend assisting people caught in the rising floodwaters caused by unabating heavy rain. The Korea Meteorological Administration said central and southern parts of the country could receive as much as 300 millimeters of additional rain by Tuesday, July 18. President Yoon Sok Yol, who just visited Ukraine, convened a video link response meeting on Sunday over the heavy rain in the country. President Yoon was speaking from his plane as he traveled through Poland after meeting with President Volodymyr Zelensky. He had ordered Prime Minister Han Dok Su to mobilize all available resources to minimize casualties and urged the weather agency to quickly release forecasts before more heavy rain was expected in the coming days. It is unclear how many people are still trapped in the 685 meter long tunnel in the town of Osong, but 15 vehicles are thought to also be submerged. Aerial pictures from flood affected areas showed brown mud and flood water so deep only the tops of roofs can be seen sticking out. Let's head to Canada now, where smoke from raging wildfires covered the city of Edmonton in a dusty haze over the weekend. The country is set to be on track for its worst ever wildfire season, with fires also raging in large swaths of eastern Canada, while wildfire emissions have hit record highs. About 24 million acres have already burned across the country since the month of May. Emergency Preparedness Minister Bill Blair says the Canadian military is being deployed to Quebec region to help the emergency evacuations in the north of the province. And in another development, a mysterious object has been discovered on an Australian beach, baffling locals and authorities. The giant cylinder washed up near Greenhead in Western Australia, prompting speculations online with some theorizing it was from the missing plane MH370 that appeared and disappeared in 2014. Aviation expert Jeffrey Thomas said it is unlikely from the MH370 or any Boeing 77 plane, but it will be part of a rocket that launched within the last year. The local media has reported that a joint investigation conducted by the Western Australia Police, the Australian Defence Force and Maritime Partners is currently underway. It appears to be a possible fuel tank from a rocket that was being launched in the last 12 months that's dropped into the Indian Ocean, somewhere in the Indian Ocean, and washed up at uh, Greenhead. There's no chance it's part of MH370. It's not any part of, an, of a Boeing 777, and the fact is MH370 was lost nine and a half years ago, so uh, it, would, it would show a great deal more wear and tear um, on, the, on, the, on the debris. Uh, this year, the Republic, People's Republic of China and the Republic of South Africa commemorate the 25th anniversary of diplomatic relations as part of the communication. Consul General Tang Zundong launched the Driving Education Culture short video competition in Johannesburg, South Africa. The competition garnered interest with learners from Guateng and the Free State Province submitting competitive educational videos. Now, this competition provided high school learners with a unique opportunity to explore the cultural diversity between both nations. Winners were announced at the special event 
at the Chinese Consulate General in Johannesburg. As South Africa correspondent Innocent Samosa was there and now reports. The event called Hashtag Driving Education Culture is part of a lineup celebrating the 25th anniversary of diplomatic relations between China and South Africa. Their bilateral trade has grown exponentially over the years, increasing from less than 1 billion rands in 1998 to the current levels of 544 billion rands in 2021, despite the COVID-19 pandemic. So this competition for our learners is to get them to learn and understand why China has always been committed to its foreign policy goals of upholding world peace and promoting common development. The Chinese Consul General, Consul General Tang Zhongdong, who hosted the event, says this year has been a good year for diplomatic relations with South Africa. During these 25 years, the, the, the relations between our two countries has got significant progress and the, the trade is already rose up from the beginning 1.4 billion US dollar to the 56.7 billion US dollar of last year. As South Africa prepares to host the BRICS summit next month, Consul General Tang said that the BRICS blog can never be ignored. It already show, show, it already shown its function to them, not only to BRICS members, but as well to a lot of other developing countries. That is why the, the, it has been attracted by more and more countries. Selected learners were honored for their outstanding contributions to the Driving Education Culture Shot Video Competition. How much of research went through that particular uh, research? Um, a lot of research, but it's also like a build up of all the things that I have done in um, high school, especially in the diplomatic space, as I am part of the model United Nations. So we do work um, with um, diplomatic relations between countries. And I think I've worked so much with the diplomatic relations between China and South Africa. What are you going to do with the money? I'm going to put it in the bank. <laughs> like, even though it was, in a way, it wasn't an individual like we did, I didn't do it individually because I had the help of my former school, my current school. The celebration continued with the learners, educators and dignitaries coming together to appreciate the talent displayed during the competition. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Simos, Channel Television News. Still ahead on the world today. The Qatar inside the salt hates of the United Arab Emirates, promising many health benefits. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Turkey's President Tayyip Erdogan says that he is open to meeting with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, but that setting the withdrawal of Turkish troops from Syrian territory as a precondition for talks was unacceptable. Turkey has been the biggest military and political ally of the Syrian opposition, which controls the last rebel bastion of the western, northwestern Syria. Ankara has also set up dozens of bases and deployed thousands of troops in northern Syria, preventing the Russian-backed Syrian army from retaking the region. Speaking to reporters in Istanbul, the head of his departure for the three-day visit to Saudi Arabia, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, Mr. Edwin said that Turkey was never shut, has never shut the door to discussions with the Syrian government. Mr. Edwin first said earlier this year that he may meet Syrian President Assad as part of a new peace process. But Mr. Assad said in March that there was no point in the meeting with Mr. Edwin until Turkey's illegal occupation ended. And it was another Bastille Day celebration for French citizens around the world. France's ambassador to Nigeria, Emmanuel Blattman, also both says that both countries enjoy strong economic partnerships as Nigeria is France's number one trade partner on the continent. Normally celebrated on July the 14th, this year's celebration in Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital, took place over the weekend. The unusual crowd at the Alliance Francaise in Ikoyi, Lagos, has been venue for the French National Day two years in a row now. 
the French ambassador Emmanuel Blackman, the consul general Horace Montmeron, diplomats, members of the French Nigeria business community, government officials, and friends of France joined in marking the country's 234th Independence Day, otherwise known as Bastille Day. The Bastille, once a prison mainly for politicians, had come to symbolize the harsh rule of the Bourbon monarchy. The taking of the Bastille on July 14, 1789, signaled the beginning of the French Revolution and a symbol of the end of the ancient regime. As Lagos State is the host of the party, Governor Babajide Somolu's goodwill message was delivered by the Secretary to the State Government, Mrs. Bimbola Salu Hundain. All the members of the diplomatic corps. She said the French National Day was an opportunity to celebrate the commonalities between both countries. Today, we join the French Republic to celebrate our National Day. And as we do this, we remember and cherish the robust and enabling ties that bind our two countries, particularly in the areas of trade, education, arts, and culture. Our partnership is built on a foundation of shared values and a commitment to democratic principle, human rights, and sustainable development. The Lagos State Government is proud to be partner in progress working hand in hand to improve the lives of our citizens and contribute to a more prosperous and happy world. Giving her address in a mix of French and English, Ambassador Blackman highlighted various projects both countries are partnering on. With Lagos State, we're doing a lot also. Uh, we signed last year with His Excellency the Governor an MOU to develop, uh, to promote and develop uh, eSport. And uh, one month ago, we also uh, created a new fund to support ni young uh, Nigerian entrepreneurs in the fashion, design, dance, and video game sector. She later spoke some more about the partnerships on the sidelines of the celebrations. I think Nigeria and uh, France have uh, uh, very uh, long-lasting uh, relationships. Actually, our bilateral cooperation, you know, uh, has existed ever since the independence. In some cooperation, it's been decades. And now we're really uh, trying to uh, build new partnerships, um, especially for uh, the young people, uh, women, youth, uh, uh, artists. There's so much talent here in Nigeria. Uh, so we have many exciting projects ongoing. Nigeria and France enjoy good economic partnerships. Nigeria is France's leading partner in Sub-Saharan Africa and the fourth largest in Africa behind Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia. In 2018, Nigeria ranked 28th among suppliers to France in the world and was France's 60th largest customer. Amarachi Ubani, Channel Television News. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has arrived in the United Arab Emirates for the second stop of a Gulf tour focused on securing energy supplies and offering Japanese green technology. Kishida met with Emirati President Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan after landing in Abu Dhabi. And state news agency WAM said the two leaders discussed a comprehensive strategic partnership between the UAE and Japan. They also signed several agreements covering different sectors. Japan is actively developing greener and renewable energy technologies, aiming to be carbon neutral by the year 2050. Mr. Kishida will also try to promote Japanese know-how, as energy-producing countries have also pledged to achieve a net-zero transition, especially ahead of COP28 climate summits to be held in Dubai in November. And what would it feel like to own something once owned by a royal? Well, you could find if you have enough money to compete for it at an auction. But what sort of item will it be? Here's a start. A jumper won by Britannia's late Princess uh, Diana. That's Britain's late Princess Diana. And depicting a black sheep 
is headed for auction. That will happen later this summer, with a price estimate of up to £80,000. Designed by Knitwear label, warm and wonderful, the sweater, which will headline Sotheby's fashion icons on August to September the 31st, an online sales was rediscovered in an attic earlier this year by one of the Brown's founders. The diner first wore the red jumper, which depicts a lone black sheep among rows of white sheep, to watch then Prince Charles play in a polo game back in June 1981, just one month before they were married, sparking speculation over its potential significance. And after it was damaged on the wrist, her private secretary, Olivia Everett, wrote to warm and wonderful co-founder, Jonah Osborne, asking if it could be repaired. Then the jumper was sent back. A few months later, Diana received a replacement, which was photographed wearing in 1983. But Osborne found the original in a box in her attic in the month of March. Princess Diana was first uh, photographed in 1981 wearing the warm and wonderful sheep sweater. Uh, as soon as she wore it, it was on the front page of every newspaper. It was really talked about, um, I think really for the theme of it, of a black sheep on a bunch of white sheep on this red sweater. Um, and it really blew up Warm and Wonderful, their brand. They got the ultimate uh, kind of uh, influencer coverage back in 1981 of Princess Diana choosing to wear this specific sweater in a very public arena, which was a polo match of Prince Charles. And she had just recently gotten engaged. So in um, 1981, soon after she was photographed wearing the sweater, um, Buckingham Palace sent Sally and Joanna, the founders of Warm and Wonderful, a letter saying that the sweater had been damaged on the wrist and if they could repair it and or replacement because she really loved this sweater. And it's so interesting that uh, there's been a speculation of how much she liked the sweater, but the leather letters actually prove that. Um, what they did is actually sent her a replacement in 1981 because they felt like they couldn't um, repair it properly. Uh, the sweater basically kind of got forgotten for 40 years. Um, but interestingly enough, in 1983, she was photographed wearing the replacement. So in March of this year, uh, Joanna was looking for patterns in her attic, and she uh, came across a small white box, and in the box was the sweater that they had just, um, back in the 1980s, their brand was blowing up. They just assumed that the sweater maybe got sent to another buyer. They thought it had gotten repaired, but it actually had just been forgotten in this box for 40 years. Quite interesting. And something interesting again, amidst the UAE's arid desert climate, a cave made entirely of stone salt offers visitors a fresh breath ripe with natural health remedies. The man-made facility located in Al Ain also offers a variety of treatments including halotherapy sessions during which visitors inhale salt infused air. Others come to the cave simply to relax while dipping their feet or their full body in salt. The stone salt imported from Polish city is known for its negatively charged ionized salt particles at 84 trace elements and minerals. Some practitioners say that exposure to this has the ability to improve breathing, sleep, fight skin infections, and even reduce stress. Several sources indicate that halotherapy was first discovered in the, 19, in the 1800s when salt miners in Poland noticed the benefits of their, so their skin and the respiratory health. However, many medical doctors are skeptical about the benefits of this treatment, and they are cautioning that this should be seen as companion therapy to a doctor-recommended regimen. And on that note, we end the world today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Enjoy the rest of the week.